from recruiting and consulting firm RiderFlex. I'm your host, Steve Urban, and here is your RiderFlex podcast episode of the day. Pat Snyder on the RiderFlex podcast for the second time. How you doing, Pat? I'm doing great. Uh, thank you again for having me back. Uh, I look forward to the opportunity to, to give back to, to your, your clients and, and, and your podcast listeners. So thank you. You give great advice, uh, really awesome advice from a career perspective, job candidate perspective. So, and what your, uh, your best of clip, I think is one of the top, you know, uh, views on our YouTube channel. And so, yeah, I really appreciate you being back on. I'm going to hit you with a bunch of questions today, try to get some advice, uh, and we'll move through them. I appreciate uh, you taking the time for it. Before we get into the uh, career questions, though, just real quick, uh, another just quick overview, Pat Snyder, the person, and the early career stuff, and just kind of give people a nice overview of you, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, you know, at at the heart, I, I'm just a family man. I, I come from a long line of hard workers, my grandparents, my parents brothers, cousins, we're all farmers, construction workers, firefighters, civil servants. They're truly the backbone of the company. And that's why I get so excited about opportunities like this uh, to help people, especially during the time that we're going through right now. Um, it's been a right. difficult year. Um, you know, I was, I was raised in Wisconsin. The day I graduated, I moved to Colorado so I could uh, spend as much time skiing as possible. And uh, my family and I, we really enjoy all things outdoor, like to remain active. Um, and um, we, we climb a mountain every year. I don't know if we've ever talked about that, but oh. the, entire, the entire family gets out and we climb a 14er, which, which is a big mountain in Colorado. Cool. Uh, I, I've done it 11 times. And, you know, from a career perspective, uh, you know, I, I've just looked for opportunities again and again and again. I, I started off as a bus boy and, and worked my way up by taking chances, knocking on every door I can. Um, but I relied really heavy on relationships. And my secret sauce is I stole everything I could from leaders that I worked with. Um, what they did well, what they didn't do well, um, I used that at further points in my career, just at, at, you know, step by step, I moved forward again and again and again. So. Did you have the goal to be an HR executive when you were in college? I mean, I know it's kind of what you majored in. Were you thinking, hey, I want to be a big time HR executive for a large company? Was that the goal? You know, uh, not necessarily big time HR executive, uh, but I, I did realize early on that I had a passion for people. Um, and, and we'll probably talk about this a little bit later, but I also realized um, that companies in general and, and HR departments, frankly, um, we're not really good at aligning people with the organizational mandate or strategy. They, you know, companies, especially years ago, um, used people as, as resources. And, and I, I, I was personally um, um, uh, ashamed of that. I, I, I didn't feel that that was the most appropriate way to, to align people with, with companies. So. Uh, I, I got into it out of a, out of a mission to, to help people and align them. Very good. And right now your current role, head of people operations and strategy at Chevron federal credit union. Can you just give a quick overview of your current responsibility? Yeah. When you look at my job description, right, it says things like, you know, benefit strategy, compensation, employee relations, culture, and all those traditional things that you see in a um, HR department, job description, but at, at the end of the day, I'm really tasked with, um, again, aligning people with the organizational strategy, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I develop um, processes, procedures, practices, strategies that maximize what human beings can contribute to the organization. I do what I can to dispel policies because controlling people or trying to get people to fit into a box is counterintuitive to what they're built to do. They're built to create. And, and when we align our people and we support our people, uh, they do great things. So that's really what my job is all about is, is, is inspiring people on a daily basis and aligning them with our corporate strategy. Awesome. Very good. Great career so far, by the way. Congratulations on everything you have done and the position you have. Thank you. I'm excited to be with Chevron and Spectrum, Spectrum Credit Union. They're, they're a 
they're a dream come true and a great organization for our employees and for our members. I want to get into some job interviewing tips for candidates. You know, you've, you've yep. interviewed just a few people in your career. <laughs> I have still am. Yep. Probably thousands hired hundreds and hundreds. Um, yeah. Let me ask you a few specific tips around, you know, interviewing for a job. Uh, how about this? I'm just starting my career search. I either got laid off or I want to switch and I'm just starting. What are just a couple of things real quick I should do right away if I'm, if I'm in the beginning of my job search? Yeah, first of all, get into the mindset that that job search is your new job. That is what you do now, 40 hours a week, days, nights, weekends, you are constantly plugged in. You can't do it part time. OK, but it, it starts with uh, putting together a plan. And sometimes there's there's short term plans that get you to the long term plan. But take a little time to kind of map it out and and start your journey that aligns uh, with that plan. Um, next, regardless of what industry or level you're at or industry you're in, I, I recommend um, ABC, always be connecting, always be networking, start talking to people. 80% of job placements are because of, of, of networking, um, you know, situations. So 80%. Um, wow. Wow. Yeah, put, put together a plan and start talking to people and, and you're already moving in the right direction, but um, you know, don't, don't get lackadaisical about your efforts. Your, your job is just different than it was before. Is LinkedIn important? I mean, you know, do I need to, if I'm, if I'm in my career search, do I need to really be active on LinkedIn? What, how do you kind of rate the, the importance of LinkedIn overall? Yeah, great question. For, for most industries, I, I'd say it is. Um, other than personal relationships and networking, it is the primary way that organizations find talent and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if, if you're in um, an industry that, that maps nicely to the LinkedIn um, framework and, and footprint, then, then absolutely, you, you should be present, you should be active, you should have your voice heard. Occasionally, individuals, um, there's, I'm sorry, there's a lot of individuals that are in roles that are not necessarily 100% aligned to the LinkedIn framework, but I would still take that methodology and apply it, right? So you don't have an online mechanism, but you still should have your voice heard in your community. You should still be um, active in your community, and you should be constantly expanding your, your, your virtual your virtual network. So that, that framework applies to, I, I think, most. And it's, it's really about amplifying your voice and, and, and showing up. Very good. Does the picture matter, by the way? Um, I don't, you know, the picture, I think the picture should um, be professional, but um, it isn't a mandatory thing. It, it okay. is a, an additional thing. It, 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 the picture, your background, your everything together really shows up as your, your whole self, right? Mm. So if, if something is out of order or something doesn't match, um, you know, there should be a viable reason why that is. So it's, mm. it's not mandatory, but, but make sure you have a story behind it. Okay, very good. How about this? I'm getting ready for my job interview. Two or three tips. I'm like, you know, I know we could talk for hours on just this yeah. one question, but two or three quick tips on preparing for my job interview. Well, first of all, we've got, you and I have got a great podcast about this subject. Uh, so I refer you back to that previous podcast. But to me, it really comes down to three things. Networking, research, and practice, 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 practice. And each one of those things, again, we could spend a lot of time about that. I've already commenting on networking, but let's talk a little bit about research, right? You've, you've got to understand who you're sitting in front of, both the company and the individual. You have to spend time looking into uh, the structure, their values, um, what are they doing in their community? What are they proud of? Um, and, and bringing that into the conversation. And then especially uh, for individuals, um, and it doesn't matter where you are in, in the hierarchy, if you're a college graduate just starting, or if you're a seasoned professional, practice, practice, practice. You will fail miserably your first time out on the interview. And you may think you did well, but if you could put yourself into an environment with 
people that you trust and they will give you good advice and you practice, practice, practice and get that advice, you'll really uh, hone your, 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 your skills. And it's nice to get that feedback from people that care about you. So mm, network research good. practice. Very good. How about this? Here's something people don't talk about a lot. What mistakes do you see candidates make once they're in process and the the courtship, so to speak, has started? They've done the interview, but now there's emails and phone calls and correspondence going back and forth um, after the first interview. I, I often see some missteps there myself with candidates. What what do you see and what, what advice do you have there? Yeah, but well, each company culture is a little bit different, but the advice that I have, I think runs through most of them. Number one, uh, as the recruiter, I am not your friend. Uh, my role is to see through you and mm-hmm. align you with the role that I'm recruiting for. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes I come across as your friend. So don't take me for granted. Don't misjudge me. I, I do like to be liked, but I'm also doing my job at that point in time. So, so don't take me for granted and, and don't rely on the relationship that we just formed in 30 minutes to get you through the next step. Um, so do the formalities and follow up. Um, I do keep track of who sends me a thank you note or not. Mm-hmm. It doesn't always make a difference and whether they get the job or not, but it certainly does help. I guarantee it. Mm-hmm. And then secondly, don't underestimate the competition. There are people out there working harder than you and they may be more or less qualified, but they might be a better networker. They might be a better interviewer. They might have an edge on you from an educational standpoint. You cannot underestimate your competition. You've got to show up uh, all in every time. Very good. Awesome advice. What a couple of favorite questions you like to ask, or do you have specific ones you ask every interview? Um, what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, I, I do have ones that I ask at, at every interview and they're, and they're based upon, I've been in HR for um, a long time mm. and I've seen what successful people do as they migrate through their, their, their jobs and their, and their career. And I tend to focus a lot on questions that have to do with grit and overcoming obstacles, right? So, so most people can do a job. It, it's, it's responding to the unknown that makes a difference. Sometimes there's positive opportunities that you have to seize and, and take advantage of. And sometimes there's negative situations um, that happen that you, you have to pivot. You have to do something different than what you typically do or what you plan to do. So those are that is one example um, you know, that I, I tend to focus in on. Where have you had a plan? Um, that, that was disrupted um, and you had to overcome obstacles or demonstrate grit. Tell me about the situation. What was your uh, behavior and action and ultimately what was the result? Um, you know, overcoming obstacles, learning from mistakes and managing multiple stakeholders are, are three questions that I generally ask every single candidate. Mm, very, very good. Here's something that comes up uh, for me, uh, you know, as a recruiting firm, you know, we interview people every day. Should candidates, should candidates bring stuff up that they know the interviewer is probably worried about, but maybe the interviewer didn't ask the question. For example, maybe they have an hour and 15 minute commute and the candidate is worried that, you know, the commute's too long and the interviewer is probably worried about it too. But for whatever reason, the interviewer doesn't bring it up. Um, should the candidate speak to those concerns that they, they know the interviewer is probably worried about or should they not bring them up if they're not asked the question? Yeah, I think, you know, the objective here is to find the right fit, right? Am I, as the interviewer, interested in this person as a, can- as a potential employee? And vice versa, is that employee interested in, in me as a candidate so, uh, or as an employer? So I think you should get it all out on the table and establish a, a, um, a relationship of transparency and trust from the very beginning. Uh, you could introduce the question by saying, uh, is there anything that you're concerned about that we should spend a little extra time to talk about and then, and then validate that assumption? 
that you think they're worried about the commute. Uh, mm -hmm. Or you could just say uh, flat out, you know, I, I, I know there's a long commute associated with this role, but that pales in comparison to the long term benefits that I'm going to get from an experience perspective. Mm -hmm. So turn it into a, um, a strength uh, as opposed to a, a concern. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, I would, uh, you know, in the interest of transparency and trust and, and finding the right fit, I, I'd recommend getting out um, what whatever is on your mind or their mind, maybe okay. validate that first. Okay, speaking of transparency and trust, should should people say, hey, look, yeah, they fired me. <laughs> here's why here's why I bring that up. I mean, just so often, you know, people just skate around that question. They they'll say something like, well, you know, we 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 reached a mutual uh, uh, <laughs> decision to separate or uh, you know, they'll, they'll say something other than, you know, or they'll say something like, well, you know, I just didn't agree with the direction of the company or some, some bullshit line that yeah. you're, you're thinking, you're thinking as the interviewer, like, okay, so you were fired. Sh should you just say, Hey, look, I screwed up. I, this is what happened. They terminated me. I learned from it. Um, I'm stronger for it. And I'm, and I'm looking for another opportunity. I mean, how should you answer as a candidate? Yeah, well, you, you just touched on it. A skilled interviewer knows that you're giving them a bunch of BS, right? And they can see right through it. Uh, but I think the answer is yes. I, I just had this happen last week where, where um, an individual uh, told our, our talent acquisition team that, that they were let go and they explained the situation. We believed them and, and, and we brought them on board. We're excited to have this person join the team. But I can also share with you personally, um, when I was, was, I was uh, much younger, I was 19, um, I was fired and um, I went to, to apply for the very next job um, and I told them what had happened in my previous job. And we talked through it and we had an honest conversation and we, we did exactly what you just said. We, we focused on kind of some of the, the situation around it, let them know that I admit the mistake and that I have learned from it. So learning from mistakes, remember that's one of my questions that I ask everybody is, is give me an example of where you've uh, learned from a mistake and how you turn that into a learning opportunity. So um, I, I can just tell you personally, I, I've done it. I remember the conversation like it was yesterday um, and, and I was really happy with the way it turned out. Uh, I, I, I um, had, a, had a great um, summer job experience as a result of it. So. I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, I really respect people that just tell me what happened and, and don't BS me. I really do. It just, it's, it speaks to their character and just all kinds of things. Very similar situation. You know, I was 21 years old. I was a manager of a convenience store uh, in a small town. The police chief's daughter was a cashier for me and she was stealing money out of the register on a regular basis. And I couldn't quite catch her. I was really pissed off that she was doing it. I was trying, you know, trying to catch her. Anyway, one day, you know, the register was short again, and I just fired her on the spot. No documentation. I didn't call HR. I didn't call my boss. I just fired her. <laughs> and so, not a good idea. Uh, <laughs> so uh, her her dad, who was the police chief of the town, came into the store and started uh, lecturing me, uh, standing on the sales floor. And he and I got into a very heated conversation where we were cursing each other out basically on the sales floor in front of customers. Well, needless to say, I got fired. <laughs> so yep. Now there's two job openings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I did the same thing. I went down, I applied for Camelot Music where, uh, where you know, they used to have music stores. We had to go and buy music. Yeah. And uh, I interviewed and I said, hey, this is what happened. I, I, I fired her. I didn't touch base with HR. I should have. I got into an argument with the dad in front of customers. I made a mistake. I, you know, I'm sorry for it. And I'm just looking for another opportunity uh, and uh, hope you guys give me a shot. And yeah, you know, same thing. They, they highly respected that. I got the job. I worked there for 13 years. So yeah, yeah I really nice. just encourage people to just be transparent and talk about what you learned from it. Cause it is a growing experience it almost is. every time. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, even when an individual is laid off, as as uh, humiliating as that can be, there's learning experiences in there yes. too. So you, you should turn those into a positive conversation. So. Totally agree. Let's switch gears here for tips for hiring managers. Um, let me ask you a few questions on this topic. Yeah. How about this? Uh, two or three pretty common mistakes that you see hiring managers make? <laughs> 
when they're selecting candidates? I mean, I know that's a, you could talk about that one for four hours, too, <laughs> but two or three you want to share? Yeah, I, I, I don't. I have about 10. Uh, so <laughs> I'll speak real, real quickly. Um, hiring managers tend to hire people they like. Mm. They tend to settle for someone that they can, that can do this job, even though they may not be the best fit or the most qualified. And they may be stagnated at that position too, right? You gotta, I encourage them to hire for, for future, not just that job. They rely too much on referrals and the conversation around, I have a friend, right? That would be great for this. Uh, they do as they're told. The boss says hire somebody right away and they do exactly that. They run out There's and hire one. somebody right away. Mm -hmm. Then in more of the corporate environment, I, I see hiring managers or companies they, they identify the wrong core competencies. And I know we'll talk about soft skills at some point, it's gotta come up, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, we look at this list of core competencies and we say, you know, this is a good one, this is a good one, and this is a good one, but there's no science behind it. They just kind of guess. <laughs> and, and, and then they get a misfit person. Mm. They make a hiring decision in a vacuum, right? Who knows better than them who the right person is? Well, I introduced the likelihood that you don't that no one person should be making that decision, that you should involve key stakeholders, maybe even members of the team um, in, into that process. Um, they think they need one thing when they really need something different and they end up hiring the wrong person. And now more than ever, and this one baffles me, they only look within their geography for jobs that can be done remotely, right? Not right. every job can be done remotely, but the the science is there. It's happening right now. You don't have to sit next to your employee to ensure that they're doing a good job. Or if you do, then I question your leadership capability. Yes. So mm, great point. Thanks. Great point. Boy, I love all of those. Um, yeah, don't don't hire in a vacuum. Make sure you get the 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 key stakeholders involved. I mean, that is a big one, is is where I see hiring managers deciding what what is needed without discussing it with their boss or maybe the CEO or maybe the HR partner or the other recruiter. They didn't, nope. they, they didn't decide together what they really wanted um, before the job started. And yeah, that that's huge, but all of those are great. Yeah. And, and yep. now these, these days, I mean, gosh, the, the talent pool just opens wide now right you don't have to hire a software engineer in oklahoma city right if you're no. if your company's based there you can get a software engineer anywhere and, and yeah. so yeah you're huge on hiring remote yep absolutely how do you grade soft skills and maybe maybe you could you could define it as maybe personality or style match how do you grade that over specific experiences or skills on the resume? So one of my daughters is a bit of an artist and she likes to draw and paint. And she is working on a project right now that is just, it's just gorgeous, it's beautiful. Mm. And she's, she's blending colors and she's shading and she's balancing, I, I don't know what, the science behind it is, but she's doing all these really, really cool things. And I think interviewing is like that too. It's, it's a blending, it's yeah. a shading, it's, yeah. it's pulling in different elements, right? And soft skills really tells us a lot about how a person does their job. Mm. Their, their resume may tell us what they've done but without understanding the how or the soft skills or the cultural change that they bring to the table, I'd say you're making a short-sighted decision. So I'm, I'm not going to say one is more important than the other, mm -hmm. but you have to, much like a, a, a masterpiece painting, you have to blend it, you have to shade it, you have to balance it and, and bring it all in together to get the whole, whole picture. And that's what interviewing really is. It's like, wow, I don't know this person but I'm going to bring all this stuff together and, and try to get a really good answer to my question. You know, it really is an art and a dance, so to speak, <laughs> yes. right? It really is. And I, I, I respect all of the 
tech companies out there that are trying to create software and platforms to let robots make hiring decisions. And I'm not bashing those companies, you know, I wish you the best, but it really is an art form. It is a human to human art slash dance that has to happen to really make a good decision. And we talk about that as, as a recruiting team at Riderflex. We talk about yeah. that all, all the time. We are sharing different experiences and things that the candidate said or, or whatever. And it really is an art. I appreciate you saying that. I appreciate you mentioning that. Yeah. Yeah. Put, putting it all together. So. Uh, what's the, what's the biggest mistake companies make when they are working with, or maybe two or three, what are some mistakes companies make when they're working with an outside recruiting resource? They've, they've hired a recruiting firm to help them. What are some mistakes you see there? Yeah. Um, a couple things. Um, when you work with multiples, you don't have a very strong relationship. They are not invested in you and you are not invested in them. So you're getting um, employees or candidates from, from multiple different places um, and there's no natural attraction there, right? There's no, there's no motivation. So any relationship, all relationships take effort. They have to be nurtured, they have to be fed, there has to be bilateral feedback. When you work with multiple staffing agencies, mm -hmm. it's not there. So you don't get, you don't get the right candidate. So um, I would say mistake number one is, is working with um, too many agencies, okay. right? Number mm -hmm. two is they, they follow blindly and they just take the candidates as they're, as they're given. And number three, by becoming overly reliant on staffing agencies, the company could lose their own identity and become <laughs> irrelevant in the uh, in the digital space, especially and the community, the real life community too. So you can't you can't just farm out your your perception, your mm. your brand to the staffing agency. Mm, good one, good one. I I would add one more to that real quick. Uh, speaking from the side of a recruiting firm, uh, I would say one of the biggest things we see at RiderFlex is the company will give us a search with a job spec and and it's and then later on they'll they'll say well what i was really looking for was this i know i said i know i said green but really we like blue better <laughs> and when that when that happens uh what that does is basically just create a longer search create it creates frustration and disappointment for everybody so i would just encourage companies you know if you're going to give an assignment to a recruiting firm just make damn sure that what you give them on the requirements and the specs and everything are solid and everybody has agreed on it before they start the search. Uh, that's a big one I see. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Um, let's, so let's switch gears here a little bit. I want to ask you uh, from an HR perspective, company communication and process stuff, a few questions around that. Okay especially in today's climate, uh, in today's world with social media and, and social issues and, and things that are happening in the world, I see a lot of companies, not all, but I see a lot of company executives speaking out uh, so, uh, and taking a side on either political issues or social issues. The company will put out a statement or the CEO will put out a statement about a sensitive topic, a social issue of some kind. Um, it seems to be, that seems to be happening a lot more than it used to. I'm 53 years old. I didn't see a lot of that uh, back in the day. And now I do kind of see more of that all the time. I'll see an executive say, well, hey, this social issue happened. And by the way, this is what we believe. And we're going to take this side or whatever. What are your thoughts on that? Should should companies uh, and, and executives speak out and, and take sides on things like that? What are your thoughts? My thoughts are when you see that happening, what you're hearing is an individual, the CEO or whatnot. But what's really happening is that culture is speaking up. The people mm -hmm. are speaking up. Mm -hmm. And although it is a, a scary place to be, when you have the will of your people behind you, it, it becomes an expectation. 
and and as a CEO or a senior leader, you have a lot of power of influence. So you really have to be careful to be balanced, right? No one should stand at a podium and preach their way as the right and only way. But when they give their people a voice and the people are unified and aligned, um, it's, it's not the CEO talking, it's the culture talking, it's the people talking. Now, history has shown time and time again that no one person has all the answers, but a true leader can, can really help um, drive positive change in, in the community, in the organization. And, and I've been lucky to work with people like uh, uh, John Berlin, John Russell, Trudy McKenna, and Andy Doyle that have all taught me things. Remember how I mentioned earlier that I steal things from people? Right. I stole things from each one of them. Andy taught me how to uh, really understand that there's alternative perspectives and solutions and I should consider them. John Russell helped me understand that there's historical perspectives that I should be considering. John Berlin is, is currently te teaching me that uh, as leaders, we're kind of the moral compass of the organization. Mm -hmm. And Trudy McKenna said, look within yourself for the answers. Trust yourself. The answer is ultimately a lot of times w w it, you know, inside. So, so no matter what side of the political scale you're on, this is a tight race. Um, the country is divided. Mm -hmm. We need leaders that unify. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I, I think it is important that they, they speak up but it has to be their company's, their culture's voice, not their voice. How do you feel about um, this perspective on it? Uh, I'll give you the current Rider Flex take on, on this topic. And, and I'd like to get your opinion on, on our current stance on this, on this topic. I'm always telling my partner, my co-founder, uh, you know, we, we kind of have this current policy, I guess, if you will, to not take a side on on things, we're, we're we're constantly we're constantly very careful with our social media not to um, say anything political or take a side on a social issue. And my reasoning for that, selfishly as a capital capitalist, my reasoning for that is, hey, look, I want client, I want all clients. I want I want conservative clients. I want liberal clients. I want I want them all, and I don't want to piss any of them off because we we need we need to build our company, and I'll take the revenue from everybody. So I don't want to limit our prospective client base. <laughs> so I'm super careful. Is that wrong? Of I mean, is that do do you look do you look down upon Rider Flex as taking that kind of stance, or what what are your thoughts on that 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 uh, philosophy? You, you give a, a narrow, you're asking a very narrow question. And I would ask Ryder Flex, what are you doing for your community outside of that, taking that stance? What mm. are you doing to, mm. to support mm. your people and their education? Uh, I would say that Ryder Flex is doing a lot to erode uh, systematic racism across our country by helping people get jobs. Mm. I would say you're doing a lot for fairness um, by helping companies interview better and, and stamp out biases that they might have. Mm -hmm. So you, you're, you're focusing too narrowly on your, on your, on your platform. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're trying not to piss people off, which is great, but you're doing far more than that to give yourself more credit. Mm, I like that. Okay, I feel better about it now. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> Okay, cool. Very good. Here's but you've had 150 one. podcasts already that are dedicated to helping people get jobs. Mm -hmm. Thank what you, sir. What more authentic leadership is there than that? Mm -hmm. In fact, oh. you know, I think it's a wonderful thing. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Here's another one that's, that's come up a few times when I've talked to people. I was interviewing this executive uh, one time. I won't mention the company or his name. But he just went off on a rant. He said, why? He's like, he's like, why the hell do companies think they have to have a cause and a mission? He's like, what happened to the old days where a company could just make a good product for a good price and deliver it on time? He's like, why, why isn't that good enough? Why do we have to have something else? <laughs> and he was just kind of going off on it. <laughs> he's like, you know, he's like, they spend all this time on their cause and their mission. And meanwhile, the product's screwed up or they, they're not delivering or whatever. It's like, just, just execute and make a good product. Um, what are you, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, I, I have 
I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story first, then I'll give you the science behind it. Okay. Uh, as a senior HR leader, every day, every day I get emails, LinkedIn requests, phone calls about products. Hey, Pat, I've got this product. Hey, Pat, have you considered this product? Hey, Pat, look at this. I delete them all. I delete every single unsolicited email, LinkedIn post, uh, however you try to reach me. If you lead with the product, I will delete you because listen to Simon Sinek. People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. If, and, and the reason is, is because your people are the only reason you're successful, right? And if your people believe in your cause, they will be intrinsically motivated to make a difference. People don't believe in products. It's only a matter of days before somebody imitates you and and, and does it better than you. But it's hard to imitate and outpace somebody who firmly believes that what they're doing is for the betterment of X, Y, and Z, right? Hopefully it's about... It's about people, but that's what Simon is talking about. And, and when you get that right, you've got this highly intrinsically motivated workforce that, that wants to make a difference every day to every customer or client group. When you're selling a product, it's, it's, it's a machine. It's just pumping them out. And I could care less what your product is. If your employees are motivated and willing to make a difference, sign me up. I'll listen to you. That is good stuff, Pat. Wow. Great. Appreciate you sharing that. Awesome. Absolutely. I listened to the Simon Sinek, uh, start with the why, um, Ted talk once a month. And it is the very first thing that I give to my employees. Um, when, when we're starting to talk about, um, aligning and, and bringing in stakeholders and pushing forward a project, it keeps me grounded. It helps me understand how to communicate with others. Very good. Very good. I forgot to ask you this about social media. I want to come back to this just for a second for employees. Um, Do you recommend people in the middle of their career search looking for a job? Um, They're heavy into their, to the, to a career change. So they're applying, they're, they're pinging people on LinkedIn networking. Like you said, should those people be careful with what they're posting and commenting on in their social media from a social issue or political stance? You know, I'm not going to necessarily condone this answer, but the fact is they have to be, I mean, they have to be right. Mm -hmm. Um, And companies do not want to hire people that are going to cast them in a negative doubt right? We mm-hmm. see this with celebrities and professional athletes all the time, but it happens even, mm-hmm. even, you know, in, in everyday situations. So if there's an individual that is um, poking the bear from a political standpoint, mm-hmm. um, that absolutely could be reflected negatively in the, in the interview process. Now, mm-hmm. I, I, again, I, I'm not saying that's right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we as Americans, uh, what makes us Americans is we have the right to express ourselves. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but you got to find the balance and, and you, you, you need to be able to recognize when you're going off the deep end. Um, <laughs> there's there's this concept out there called the cancel, uh, the cancel culture. And I, I, I don't know if that's the right thing or not. Right. I mean, we as Americans should be able to express ourselves without being feared of being being canceled. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's that's the reality of the world that we're living in. So until that evolves or changes if if you want a job you got to get your priorities straight if expressing yourself on social media is more important than a job that you've made your decision <laughs> very good i say it i tell people the same thing we we give that advice to candidates that we're working with we're like hey look it shouldn't happen it shouldn't be part of the hiring process and companies probably shouldn't be doing this but the reality is they are going to look you up on social media so be ready for it and yeah totally agree Okay, very good. That's a great answer. Thank you very much. Um, we headed towards wrap up here. One other topic I wanted to discuss. You've had a great career and you've reached a, a, you know, a very high level now as a, as a senior VP in a big company. 
what advice would you give to somebody listening to this episode that wants to be an executive, but they're not there yet? Maybe they're at the associate level or manager okay. level and they, they just oh, they want to make VP or they want to make C level. They're trying to get there. What are a couple of things you would, you would tell them? Um, so in addition to the, to the obvious, um, that I, well, maybe it's not obvious, but number one, continue to advance your skills. Once you stop learning, you stopped growing professionally at least, right? So mm -hmm. uh, advance your, 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 your skills, stay relevant, right? Because change happens more quickly now than perhaps ever before. So uh, what's, what's relevant today is likely not going to be relevant, you know, next, next year. But the biggest thing that I find in the, in the upward progression is to, to expand your sphere of influence, right? So, so when I look at promotions, um, I think, you know, where are they in kind of the hierarchy and what are the expectations of, of the next level? And when you're starting out in your career, it's really about me as an employee getting better at the job that I do. And, and each job has criteria that they're measured against, right? And then as I, as I move up to, 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 to manager or supervisor, it's really about making my team better around me, right? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then as you move up from there, it's about making the department or the company you know, a better, a better place, more productive, more innovative, more relevant, right? And then it's about your industry. And then it's about your community, right? So mm. the higher you want to go, the more you need to expand your sphere of influence and begin rising the, the collective capabilities of everybody around you. And when you're at the echelon, or when you're at the top, that's when you need to be out in your community. That's when you need to be driving change for betterment. You need to be visiting universities to help our, our, our kids get to be better interviewers and be prepared for the future of work. You, you, you need to be leading um, volunteer efforts to, to help those that are underserved or underprivileged in, in, mm -hmm. in your area. You need to be making your industry um, a, a better place, not just yourself. If you are focused on yourself and you're a vice president, I, I don't think you're going to be successful. You certainly won't be successful in, in, in my vision of the world. So mm, sphere mm. of influence. Good stuff. I would just add one more thing on this one. Uh, having, having been a CEO of a couple of $40 million companies myself before RiderFlex, I've, I've hired and managed a bunch of people in my career. I would just add two don't assume your supervisor knows you want to move up. You really have to tell people, I, you know, tell your supervisor, tell your supervisor, supervisor, and make sure you are communicating your aspirations and telling people, you know, what you want to do with your career. You really need to communicate it. It's, it's very important. A lot of, a lot of managers, you know, they just, yep. they're, they're, they're so busy in their day to day. They look over they see Sally and they're like, oh, Sally's great. Sally does a great job. Boy, boy I sure am glad that she's, uh, you know, our accounts receivable person. She's awesome. But they may not be thinking that you want to move, move up and be a controller someday. So you need to tell them. <laughs> yeah. You know, if I could just digress, there was a story that my father used to tell me. Um, you know, he would say that there's, there's really two types of people. There's really more, but the lesson is around taking control of your, of your career. There's, there's individuals that show up, they work really, really hard. They do a good job. They give 110% and, and they're, they're rewarded by their company. But then there's individuals that show up, give 110%, do a good job, and they look for cracks in the sidewalk and they exploit them. Mm. And they're professional about their dialogue with those around them, but they're clear about their expectations. Those individuals tend to progress quicker than those that show up or card every day finding mm -hmm. those cracks and clear and effective communication uh, gets you there quicker mm. good stuff good stuff pat really awesome advice my friend i could have you on the show once a week or once a month and we could talk about so yeah, many there's, other topics. there's a lot to talk about isn't there? a lot of giving <laughs> back to do out there right so and, you know, and that's what the show is really about for Rider Flex. I mean, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a great marketing tool for our brand as a recruiting firm, but really we just feel good. And I know you, you are the same, right? 
you just feel good about helping people and giving back. And you've done that here with all the advice that you've given. I really appreciate you being on the Rider Flex podcast. Uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to have a voice and, and, and help help our folks out. So thank you. If you think today's tip or guest interview can help someone you know, please share this with them. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe to our channel and hit the like button. The Rider Flex podcast features entrepreneurs, business executives, and the stories behind how they got there, as well as daily tips on career advice and job interviewing. You can visit riderflex.com to learn more about us and get information and pricing on the recruiting and consulting services we provide. Thanks so much for listening and have a great day.